Советского правительства. He was a man of terrifying barbarity, a genius at political treachery. For a quarter of a century, he organized, he exploited, engaged in mass murder until he dominated one third of the world. His name is Joseph Stalin, and this is his biography. Mike Wallace, this is Biography. Our story, Joseph Stalin. In the early 1920s, when Stalin was scheming for power in the Soviet Union, he said, to choose one's victims, to quench an unrelenting vengeance, and then to go to bed. There is nothing sweeter on earth. This was Stalin's cold-blooded formula in his own country. And he was equally ruthless in his drive to dominate the world. Before the turn of the century, the Russian Empire is ruled by Tsar Nicholas, a weak and pleasure-loving monarch. Most of the wealth and virtually all of the political power in the nation rest in the hands of Nicholas and a small ruling class. The Russian people, the masses, live primitively, millions of them in degrading poverty. They are uneducated and oppressed. Over the years, their protests and uprisings have been smashed by the Tsars. It is from such people that Joseph Stalin comes. He is born in 1879 in the province of Georgia, the son of Caucasian peasants. Young Stalin studies to become a priest, but at the seminary he is despised by classmates as a bully and a sneak. Stalin is expelled from school when he joins a radical Marxist organization. The ideas, the political programs mean little to him, but he's swept along by the prospect of impending revolution. Violence and power fascinate him. He plays a minor role as an agitator when strikes and riots break out in the cities of Tiflis and Batum. The unrest leads to a brief but futile revolution in 1905. Stalin is arrested as an agitator. In the next few years, he will be arrested time and again. People who know him suspect he is a double agent, that sometimes he is a revolutionary, but that when it suits his purpose, Stalin becomes a spy and informer for the Tsar's secret police. Stalin becomes a follower of Nikolai Lenin, the leader of a small band of revolutionaries. Influenced by the ideas of Karl Marx, Lenin schemes to set up a communist dictatorship in Russia. He wants to overthrow the government, seize all private property, and establish what he calls the dictatorship of the proletariat, the working class. Says one observer, even when he sleeps, Lenin dreams of nothing but revolution. Lenin and his followers wait for the right moment. World War I, nearly five million Russian troops are killed defending their country against the Germans. Though his army is shattered and his people demoralized, 
Tsar Nicholas fails to realize that his grip over Russia is slipping. Early in 1917, the Tsar leaves the war to his generals and returns from the front. He is tired of war. He would rather spend his time with his family and enjoy the pleasures of royal life. His advisors warn him that the Russian people are on the edge of revolt, that he must grant his people more freedom before it is too late. But the Tsar refuses. I allow no one to give me advice, he declares. But finally, even Tsar Nicholas realizes that a crisis is brewing. He decides to leave his palace near Petrograd for the peace and safety of a military garrison 400 miles to the south. There, he says, I shall take up dominoes again in my spare time. February 1917, the Russian Revolution. The people overthrow the corrupt monarchy. Tsar Nicholas and his family are arrested and later executed. After centuries of oppression, the Russian people think they are finally free. A provisional government is set up, controlled by moderate socialists. Nikolai Lenin and Joseph Stalin have played no part in this revolution. Now, however, Lenin sets to work, scheming to overthrow the new government and seize control. Stalin plays only a minor role in Lenin's efforts to build up his radical party, which is called the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks, a mass military strength under the command of Lenin's chief lieutenant, Leon Trotsky. Now the time is right. The Bolsheviks are ready to smash the shaky new government. October 1917, a second revolution convulses Russia. The Bolsheviks surge through Petrograd. Joined by deserters from the armed forces, they storm the Winter Palace, headquarters of the provisional government. During the fighting, Stalin stays cautiously in the background. Says Trotsky, he preferred to remain on the fence at this crucial moment. The Bolshevik revolt succeeds, and Lenin becomes communist dictator of all Russia. Lenin commands that the Soviet masses be governed with an iron fist. And to carry out his orders, communist officials are strategically placed throughout Soviet Russia. Joseph Stalin becomes the chief commissar. This position gives him direct power over 130 million people. The fruits of communism are chaos and poverty. The government's tyrannical control of the farmers leads to disaster. Crops fail and the country starves. We have gone too far, Lenin admits. To prevent a total collapse of the nation, he is forced to restore some freedom, some private enterprise to the farmers. But it still takes emergency relief from a country Lenin hates, the capitalistic United States, to help save the lives of 10 million starving Russians. Nineteen twenty-four. Lenin is dead. During his last year, even this hardened revolutionary had come to hate the scheming Stalin. On the eve of his death, Lenin had planned to remove Stalin from the government. Communist officials suspect that Stalin may have poisoned Lenin, but they are too frightened to do anything about it. The Kremlin now becomes a gigantic nest of political intrigue. Within its walls and hidden from the eyes of the people, Stalin engages in a bitter struggle for control of the Soviet government. He never commits himself. He plays off one faction against the other. And finally, he emerges master of the Kremlin, dictator of the Soviet Union. Then Stalin launches the first of his famous five-year plans. The result is increased misery for the Russian people. 
the farmers are saddled with arbitrary and brutal controls by the communist government. Once again, famine grips the nation. Within a two-year period, five million Russians die of starvation. A large group of farmers called Kulaks had been permitted under Lenin to own their land. And only their farms are productive. Now, in the name of communism, Stalin subjects them to terrifying persecution. All their land is confiscated, and at least two million of them are imprisoned or exiled. Hundreds of thousands of Kulaks who resist are systematically slaughtered by the Red Army. Entire villages of Kulaks are wiped out by Soviet cannon fire. Writes one foreign correspondent, all of peasant Russia at this moment is screaming with pain and despair. Churches are closed by the government. Stalin wants to be the only god in the Soviet Union. Stalin makes infrequent public appearances. He poses as the benevolent ruler of his people. But he remains a mysterious figure even to his inner circle. He loves neither money nor pleasure, neither sport nor women, one observer says. Everyone in the Kremlin knows that he had a wife much younger than himself who despised him for his cruelty. One day in 1932, she was found shot to death. Some say it was suicide. Others say Stalin killed her. But these are matters of which the Russian people never hear. By 1933, the Soviet government has been recognized by most of the major world powers. Finally, the Russians are granted the recognition they most desire from the United States under Franklin Roosevelt. As you know, for 16 long years, a nation larger even than ours in population and in extent of territory has been unable to speak officially with the United States or to maintain normal relations with us. And I believe sincerely that the most impelling motive that has lain behind the conversations which were successfully concluded yesterday between Russia and the United States was the desire of both countries for peace, the desire for the strengthening of the peaceful purpose of the civilized world. This diplomatic recognition boosts the prestige of Stalin's nation in the eyes of the world. It also paves the way for badly needed trade and credits from the United States to bolster the chaotic economy of the Soviet Union. August 1936. Stalin begins a series of purge trials that shock the world. Most of the defendants are leading members of the Communist Party itself. They are on trial for their lives on trumped up charges of spying, subversion and treason. Stalin wants to liquidate them for two reasons. Their political power may someday be a threat to him, but more important, they have seen over the years first-hand evidence of Stalin's treachery. They know too much. Secretly, Stalin also executes thousands of his secret police officers. They have helped him stage the purge trials. They also know too much. The purges, the mass liquidations, have made Joseph Stalin absolute dictator of a servile nation. The lives of millions of his fellow Russians have been sacrificed in his climb to power. Now, he vows, he will thrust his communist regime on the entire world. Germany, 1939. For the past six years, Joseph Stalin has suspiciously watched the rise of another dictator, Adolf Hitler. Publicly, Stalin denounces Hitler. But privately, they work out a sinister agreement, a non-aggression pact between their two nations. 
This alliance between the most terrible dictators in history will open the floodgates to the most devastating war in history. September 1939. Hitler launches World War II by invading Poland from the west. Now, according to their agreement, Stalin orders his army to invade Poland from the east. As the months pass, Adolf Hitler conquers one country after another. He decides he doesn't want a long-term partner in the domination of Europe. He plans to double-cross Stalin and conquer the Soviet Union itself. Hitler's panzer divisions slash through Russia. In only six months' time, they surge to within 20 miles of Moscow. Stalin desperately wants to hold on to his communist empire. He orders his retreating armies to destroy everything behind them, to leave the Nazis only scorched earth. And then the tide begins to turn. Without shelter, running low on food and supplies, the German armies grind to a halt in the bitter Russian winter. Aided by $11 billion worth of arms and materiel from the United States, the Soviet Union begins to push back the Nazi hordes. November 1943. In the midst of the war, the Tehran Conference. The first face-to-face -face meeting of the big three, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. This conference and those to follow will decide the course of history for years to come. Some of Roosevelt's advisors warn him that Stalin is a cynical and dangerous ally. But Roosevelt says, I just have a hunch that Stalin is not that kind of man. If I give him everything I can and ask nothing from him in return, he will work with me for world peace and democracy. The three leaders agree that British and American forces will undertake a full-scale invasion of France, the second front, to take the pressure off the embattled Red Armies. And Stalin wins another point. He stubbornly demands that he be allowed to retain influence over the Polish territory, which he conquered at the beginning of the war. Stalin has gained valuable concessions at Tehran. February 1945, Yalta, the last meeting of Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin. Germany is almost beaten, and Stalin agrees now to declare war on Japan. During the conference, he declares, I want a drink to our alliance. We should not deceive each other. As a naive man, says Stalin, I think it best not to deceive my ally, even if he were a fool. celebrates the end of the war in Europe. One of the celebrators is Stalin's son, Vasily, an Air Force general. In spite of the mysterious circumstances of his mother's death years before, Vasily remains close to his father. Joseph Stalin is now exalted. He has not only saved his empire, he has enlarged it by taking military or political control of large areas of Eastern Europe. July 1945, the Potsdam meeting. Churchill, Stalin, and Harry Truman, who has become president after the death of Franklin Roosevelt. The three powers agreed to divide Germany into various allied occupation zones. Berlin, though in the Soviet zone, will be occupied by all the allied powers. During the conference, Stalin is criticized by Truman and Churchill for his tactics in Eastern Europe. 
But he dismisses the accusations. They're all fairy tales, he says. By the end of the Potsdam Conference, Stalin is confident that he will have a free hand to do anything he wants with most of Eastern Europe. An iron curtain has descended across the continent, says Winston Churchill in 1946. Behind it, Stalin enforces his domination on one country after another, by bayonets and by subversion. In Poland, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Hungary. By the end of the 1940s, Stalin's control of virtually all of Eastern Europe is secure. Now he turns to Asia. Stalin makes one of the most significant pacts in the history of power politics, an alliance with Mao Zedong, dictator of Red China. Stalin's communist empire now dominates one third of the world, one billion people. But Joseph Stalin knows that to protect all of his power, he must be increasingly ruthless. Over the years, he has made many new enemies within the Kremlin. It is time now to do something about them. One day, an elderly communist official by the name of Andrei Zhdanov happens to die, and a scheme takes shape in Stalin's mind. He will charge that Zhdanov was murdered, and he will pin the blame on his own enemies. Stalin plans to stage another purge trial. In January of 1953, Stalin stuns the Russian people by publicly charging that traitors are at work within the Kremlin. They have hired a group of doctors, he says, to assassinate loyal communist officials. Stalin vows to uncover the traitors behind the doctor plot and bring them to justice. Then suddenly, from within the walls of the Kremlin, an astonishing bulletin is issued. Joseph Stalin is gravely ill, it says. He has suffered a cerebral hemorrhage. Then, on March 5, 1953, Joseph Stalin is dead. More than a million people will wait in line to see his body, which is placed next to Lenin's in the mausoleum in Red Square. The dictator's death starts speculation throughout the world. Stalin had obviously been planning a political purge. Perhaps his intended victims beat him to it, killed him first. Nobody outside of the Kremlin knows for sure. But Joseph Stalin, the shoemaker's son who brutally schemed his way to domination over one third of the world, is now dead. A power struggle takes place within the Kremlin to determine his successor. The man who finally triumphs is Nikita Khrushchev. It was Khrushchev who carried out many of Stalin's political purges in Moscow and mass murders in the Ukraine. In a remarkable speech in 1956, he tries to whitewash both communism and himself. He admits that horrible crimes were committed in the past, but Stalin alone was guilty, he says. The system which Stalin built is innocent. And so am I, he claims. Khrushchev orders an end to the cult of Joseph Stalin. He decrees that Stalin's body be removed from its place of honor and buried in an obscure grave within the Kremlin walls. Throughout the Red Empire, statues in Stalin's honor must be destroyed. Such is the final reward for Joseph Stalin, the tyrant whom Khrushchev once called our father, our leader, a loving gardener who tends and cares for us all. George Kennan, our former ambassador to the Soviet Union, said this of Stalin. He was a man of incredible criminality without pity or mercy. In his entourage, no one was ever safe. 
Such was the man who built the communist empire. If there is any lingering question today about the nature of communism, the brutal career of Joseph Stalin should provide the answer. Mike Wallace for Biography. Thank <laughs> you.